Hi everybody and welcome to the YouTube channel here. Thanks for joining us for another interview about philosophy and I hope you've enjoyed these and feel free to comment or ask questions or just kind of get a dialogue going because that's what it's all about as we talk about topics related to philosophy. And I'm very, very happy uh, to have my next guest uh, here in my home studio, a different studio than we've been using before. His name is Dr. Ron Moeller and uh, he has a degree in philosophy from the University of Dallas that he got back in the mid 80s. He's also the father of many kids and grandkids. And um, uh, Delight also want to thank uh, his daughter, Julie, and her husband, John, for arranging this. I was actually at a Christmas party, and they said, hey, you should interview Dr. Moeller. And I said, sign it up. Get, get it, get it, get it uh, you know, on the schedule, and here we are. So welcome. Thanks for being well, here. Well, thank you, uh, Dave. It's really a lot of fun, and it's always uh, delightful to talk about philosophy and put, uh, share uh, ideas and put our wits together to see if we can understand the great things about human existence and what yeah. we're all about and what's important in life and things like that. So, so thank when, you. when did the philosophy bug hit you? Where is that as a kid, when did you say, yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna study this, I wanna learn it? Well, I just uh, was talking about uh, geometry and I did well in math in uh, middle school and high school. And I really appreciated the uh, clarity that you have for mathematics. And so when I went off to university, uh, I really didn't know, I hadn't had much of a preparation in philosophy. And so it wasn't until my junior year that I took my first philosophy course. And mm -hmm. I took it in Spain because I had decided to uh, go junior year abroad with my university in Spain. And we had a marvelous class, a, a specially organized class for just our university students studying there. And that's when I really got interested in philosophy, that there you could have the certainty, the clarity that you have in mathematics with regard to philosophical notions, justice, the nature of the person, truth, goodness, things like that. Mm -hmm. Then you went on and got your, your uh, PhD, and you've been teaching uh, yes. on and off ever since. I know oh, you were yeah. very involved in Ivy Maria University. Uh, Correct. Uh, uh, after, uh, actually before I finished at UD, uh, we started a little college in Fort Worth, Texas, the College of St. Thomas More, oh, yeah. along yeah. with Dr. James Patrick. Yes. And we brought that school uh, up to speed and got accreditation and everything. And then in 1995, my wife and I decided to move to Michigan, kind of for a change of venue and a change in the weather. <laughs> and I was the academic dean up there to school uh, at St. Mary's College in Orchard Lake. And then uh, that's when uh, Tom Monahan, I bet you know Tom oh, Monahan, yeah, yeah. the pizza man, Domino's, magnet, yeah. uh, invited me to start Ave Maria College, not the university. It grew into the university, but we started Ave Maria College in 1998. Hmm. And I taught there for a long time. Uh, we finally uh, kind of, uh, they moved to Florida. We stayed in Michigan. I've been teaching most recently at the University, uh, Western Michigan University. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very nice. Well, this broad topic for this interview is epistemology. Yes. And it's right. something that is one of the first things that really fascinated me as I read the Summa Theologia. And when you talk about math, it makes me think of Descartes. So right. uh, where do you want to start? I guess let's just go ahead and for folks watching who may not even know what we're talking about. Yeah. Epistemology, the study of knowledge, right. the, 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 the philosophy uh, understanding, of knowledge. Yeah. the philosophy of knowledge. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Aristotle said it so well. Man is a rational animal, and uh, all men by nature desire to know. Yeah. And right. anyone who's breathing and thinking and in any way uh, human is wanting to understand the natures of things, the principles and causes of why things happen, so that we can situate ourselves in the world, understand what's going on, and go from there. And so these all involve, uh, you know, the questions of uh, of knowledge, when we can have certainty about knowledge, what knowledge means, the different forms of evidence that support knowledge claims. These are all the issues that come under that heading of epistemology. Yeah, I think most people go through their life, and if they've never taken a philosophy course, if they've never really thought about thinking, yes, they kind of the default is I see things and I come to know them. I know there's a book over there, and I know you're there, and uh, you know I've got a you know the the, the holder here, and then that, that that's it. So why why 
why is it necessary to go deeper than that? And why did philosophers feel like we really have to dig into epistemology? Well, uh, because uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, what you're saying is true. Most people really trust our sense perception. You know, we uh, are uh, uh, living beings with uh, uh, <coughs> the senses that put us in touch with things in the world. And uh, we trust uh, especially the sense of sight and uh, the other senses. But at the same time, they sometimes deceive us. And, uh, you know, sense perception is not perfectly reliable. But the uh, spirit of philosophy, the love of wisdom, you remember that philosophy means the love of wisdom, uh, uh, spurs us on to think about things more deeply and to see if we can establish that there are absolutely certain things that are true. Yeah. When you talk about geometry and math, it makes me think of uh, Descartes. Right. But I, I'd rather n not start with him. Uh, can we go back to the Greeks and talk sure. about was was Plato the first epistemologist or were the pre-Socratic? Like obviously Socrates was. Yeah, right. Well, what, what, when did epistemology kind of hit, hit the scene? Well, yeah, I, actually it's so uh, second nature to us that uh, uh, it wasn't uh, that big of an issue in the early days of philosophy as it eventually worked out by the time we come to Descartes and modern philosophy. But the thing is that, uh, uh, sure, back then there were uh, the uh, whole uh, uh, movements of the pre-Socratics who trusted common sense. And that's another thing, going back to your observation about people, that uh, we have common sense and we can figure out some things just on our own. And that's doing philosophy, you see, because everyone has an idea about issues like uh, uh, justice and fair treatment. Uh, issues like uh, what a good life is, what happiness is. These are all things that if you're alive and breathing you have uh, views about. And philosophy tries to sharpen that and bring those into uh, greater uh, clarity. And uh, there's where then the, the uh, nature of epistemology and uh, the issues of uh, knowledge uh, came to the fore uh, like with Socrates in the marketplace. The Pythagoreans before that had been the earliest uh, kind of mathematically minded folks. Mm -hmm. And certainly Plato was heavily, and Socrates was, both were heavily influenced by the Pythagoreans. Yeah, and it seems like Plato in particular was really interested yeah. in this with the whole right. ideal form and the universal. Yes, and, right, yeah, right. And, you did, you and of course Aristotle came along. I, I, did a, I did a full interview with a professor at University of Dallas, sister uh, Eleanor Gardner, about Plato and Aristotle and even Aquinas uh, on, on the soul, and we touched on that as well. Um, but it, it seemed like the... The Greeks had, they didn't agree, like Plato and Aristotle particularly, about the, the epistemology, right? When, when it comes to um, matter and form and ideals. Yeah, and there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues there and a lot of uh, problems that arose like that. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's fascinating to look at that. Uh, but Dave, let me, uh, let me uh, suggest that maybe in our conversation now, you and I could go at it maybe a little bit differently and just, uh, uh, you know, uh, not really be so much concerned with what they said, but what we think, you see. And there, on that point, uh, what I do in my uh, first, uh, first sessions in uh, my philosophy classes is just point out that philosophy, the love of wisdom, is especially concerned with ideas that are true, or truths, or statements, judgments, propositions, you know, there's different names for the, the the claims that we make about things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first issue in epistemology, I've always argued, is what does it take for a statement to be true? Mm -hmm. What does it have to do? And I challenge uh, the, the, the freshman students or the other students too to uh, <coughs> clarify in their own minds what it is that we're after when we say we want to know what's true. And then I tell them that, uh, you know, there's uh, different theories of truth and that uh, in our class discussions and for our discussions now, we can uh, proceed by agreeing on a definition of when we say things and what it means for them to be true, like this. Yeah. And so then I say, well, there's four uh, different uh, uh, broad theories of truth that we might want to embrace in our conversations for the semester. And the first one is that truth is uh, simply whatever the professor says. 
<laughs> <laughs> which is my personal favorite theory of truth. Because As a professor, right? Yes, <laughs> right, you see. And of but course, you're being facetious, though, right? Uh, I mean, because yeah, right. the, the well, professor can say anything, right? But yeah, well, that's right. And they're used to that. Pen is uh, green and yeah, that's green. right. Unfortunately, uh, you know, there is this mindset that the students pick up on uh, coming through high school that you just try to find out what the professor thinks and write that up on the exam, you see. But uh, really, there's a better definition of uh, what makes a statement true, or at least there's uh, three others that we ought to maybe consider. Uh, one is that a statement is true if uh, it's not what the professor says, but it's what the consensus opinion is. So if uh, most scientists uh, think something, then that, there's the idea that that makes it true. Or if uh, most uh, uh, Shakespearean scholars uh, you know, have views about which play came first or whatever, that makes it true. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, uh, it's clear that uh, a consensus view doesn't make it true because it's always possible that there's one person who has the right answer and 99 don't. Yeah. You see. And this is also based on something being able to be true. Like I'm thinking about, there's three of us in this room. My, my daughter's here, for those of you who don't see her. But And is it warm or cold in this room? And you and I could say it's warm, and she says it's cold, and then that, that, that becomes right. subjective, right? Right, and that's what we do in logic is to look at the uh, definition of the terms. We try to be very careful to distinguish the different meanings that we have here. Uh, you know, it were warm and cold are relative terms, and it depends on your viewpoint. Uh, but on the other hand, that's why I was asking about 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, if someone doesn't agree with that, uh, we don't think that they're right and I'm right and everyone's right because there's true evidence. But let me just say the last two views on truth are, there's also the very uh, popular view that truth just means an idea that I earnestly believe. See, if I believe it, that makes it true. And we see so much of that in the uh, context of relativism these mm -hmm. days. You know that. And yeah. <coughs> uh, it is true that uh, there's not an absolute truth about which is the, the, the best flavor of ice cream, you see. You don't go into the restaurant and say, other than, ah. Other than it being cookies and cream. But yeah, well, we'll, we'll have another conversation. Okay? Well, <laughs> it, it's, it's like in some, in some terms like uh, uh, warm and cold, uh, uh, my preference, yours, uh, it's, uh, it is relative. Yeah. But on the other hand, the idea, and uh, this is the last principle of, uh, of truth, is uh, the one that uh, St. Thomas, Aristotle, the tradition is always in insisted on that truth means an idea that tells it like it is, that corresponds with reality, that we're seeking to get away from our own kind of uh, a subjective views to arrive at the light of what reality is really about in mm -hmm. itself. And uh, since we are imperfect human beings and we can, uh, you know, have difficulties in uh, making the call and things like this, the whole nature of science is to go beyond just uh, that problem of subjectivity to be able to understand the natures of things in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the whole theme of those earlier uh, philosophers, mm -hmm. to uh, discover what's really going on in reality. And that's how philosophy was born back then. Because uh, you might remember from uh, you might remember from your uh, history about how the Greeks were inspired by the po uh, the poetry of uh, Homer and Hesiod, and in the early days, that was considered the font or the source of wisdom was uh, what the poets had said, and they also believed that the poets were being inspired by uh, the gods. And so that they would just convey to human beings the truths that the gods wanted us to know. Well, by the time we come down uh, to uh, the 6th century B.C. there in the first pre-Socratics, they wanted to go beyond that, not just being relying on the myths and the legends and the, and the, and the, uh, the stories, but rather to see things for uh, ourselves mm -hmm. and see if we can recognize that they're objective truths irrespective of uh, the particular opinions that people have. Yeah, seems like that third one is very common in our day and age. Yeah. The, uh, you yeah. know, if, I, if I feel it's true, well, it's, yeah, it's very relativistic. Right. So, yeah, if, if 
you know, if, if I open the door and a frog jumps in and I say, that's a frog, and you say, no, it's, it's a cricket, and Mora says, I think it's a refrigerator. I mean, so what, what, uh, Plato well, would say there's some ideal form of frogness that that conforms right. to, and, and I, I think... Plato, well, uh, well there, uh, there we get into the use of language, because before we can uh, uh, even talk about the frogs or the crickets or whatever, we have to be sure that we're using uh, English together. I mean, if we're, uh, you know, Germans and Spaniards and uh, Dutch or something, we're not going to have a common terminology. We know that there's something out there, but we can't communicate it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is for us to be exact in our statements so that we can get uh, uh, as much insight as we can on the basis of the agreement that we have about what the terms mean. Mm -hmm. See, And this is the whole question of uh, discussion, uh, excuse me, of definition that inspired Socrates. Yeah. You remember he sat up in the marketplace and would uh, strike up a conversation with anyone uh, about a whole uh, a bunch of things. What is virtue? What is goodness? What is beauty? What is the soul? In order to refine and bring into clarity the innermost nature of those, uh, those realities mm -hmm. like this. In order then that we can ask if there are uh, abiding features if there are necessary features about any one of those things, mm -hmm. or whether they are things that are constantly in flux and in change. Yeah. You know, back then it was kind of a discovery of the Pythagoreans that in mathematical uh, descriptions we found absolutely fixed and certain truths, whereas in the rest of the world things were coming and going, oftentimes in flux and not uh, seeing any pattern or reason. Science is like aiming at uh, to arrive at that uh, level of objective knowledge mm -hmm. but anyway where are we uh, Dave you uh, you uh, we, we can agree for our discussion that we're looking at we're, we're after truths that tell it like it is yeah yeah well well no wait a minute but don't you want to hear all my opinion <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, in class you know I asked the students look I, I've got all these war stories and uh, old tales and I can tell they're very entertaining uh, you won't get much truth out of them but what is it about? Well, and then uh, they don't like that because they say, well, just because you're the professor, that doesn't mean you, can, you know what's true. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes, well, how does one know whether a statement is true or not? Yeah. And it's here that uh, the discussion kind of moves on to the next question of like, uh, well, when can I say or any one of us say that an idea is true? And the answer is that uh, I can only make a, a claim that something is true if I have evidence for it. And that's really kind of what learning is about, is marshalling the reasons, the evidence to support a conclusion one way or the other, uh, to be able to uh, put together a case or an argument. And mm -hmm. that's one of the classes I've been teaching. But isn't the trick of that is that evidence has to do with senses and empirical, you know, knowledge, and some philosophers wouldn't even agree that that plays a part, right? Because then now you're getting into the right. kind of whole um, matter form debate, right? Well, uh, the, that comes up for sure, but uh, it's on that point that uh, we need to kind of take the next step to say and identify well, what are the forms of evidence that help us to know something is true. And I usually uh, argue, I always argue, that there are like three different types of evidence. Right? And one of them certainly is what you just said, the evidence of the senses. And we trust our senses a lot. But uh, we also know that they can uh, deceive us sometimes, like with optical illusions or mm -hmm. the straight stick that goes into the glass of water yeah. and bends. Well, and no, it didn't. The really sun bend. looks like it's as big in the sky. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. like this. So sense perception is is really wonderful, and we use it all the time. It's the basis of science, but it's not the only form of evidence that we trust. And what's another form of evidence? Well, in our 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 reason, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, our reason, yeah, now, that's a third, a second form of evidence for sure, because uh, <clears throat> here we see uh, what's clear given, given to our basic common sense. It's what uh, we can see just by being rational to understand the meanings of things, and and let's talk about that. But 
but the, just to be sure that, that we remember that there's three forms of evidence uh, sense perception reason or I call it philosophic insight and that's what the mathematicians are doing you see they're looking at the numbers and reasoning it out for themselves you see but the third form of evidence is the evidence of other persons and things that we've been told yeah like that George Washington lived yeah or, that's right or that Jesus lived. yeah right or right. there was the walking on the water the parting of the Red Sea things like this we, we weren't there to see it yeah and as we reason about it there's nothing that said that the Red Sea had to part it's a source of evidence that we have through the oral tradition the tradition of passing along the witness and what do you think Dave? but yeah well what do I personally yeah think? do you think the Red Sea really departed a party like you know walls of water on both sides for well I think I think just to, to function in society you're gonna have to make so you have to have some leaps of faith that people are telling yeah, you the truth right. I know there's uh, people that doubt that we ever landed on the moon because yeah, they think I it was know. all yeah, staged. Yeah, sure, yeah. There's people people doubt a lot of things. They Do you uh, trust your wife when she uh, tells you things? Uh, yes. And you believe Morrow if she says something? Right? Generally, I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, and so it, that's normal and natural, but uh, uh, you know uh, those uh, revelations or the evidence that's based on testimony. Uh, has the uh, difficulty that sometimes people make mistakes. That uh, sometimes people even go farther and try to deliberately tell us things that aren't true. I don't know, it's probably never happened to you. But. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I can remember, especially with my wife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, can, can I ask you about, and maybe this falls into that last one there, is uh, authority. Yeah, uh, because uh, the, I mean, there are some things that we, because I know you and I are both Catholics, we believe that do defy the senses, like the transubstantiation of the Eucharist. Yeah, uh, we're, we're we're being told something that really, from a sense experience, <coughs> doesn't jive with reality. With air quotes. Well, yeah. And so, so authority would that fall into that same category? Of yeah. Well, it is. It's a it's a question then of. Uh, I, I like to uh, uh, relate it to being a detective who arrives at the crime scene. You see, because the first thing he does is to ask everyone what happened. What is the witness or the testimony of the observers there? And that's an important piece of information. But of course, if it happened so fast and some of them thought the car jumped first and then the guy and this, there's different accounts. And uh, uh, then he also goes on to take the uh, physical evidence of the measurements of the scene, the pictures, the uh, blood samples, whatever, and then he also then wants to know the reasons or the motives that led for something to happen. In other words, his inquires, you and I are constantly factoring in the evidence of the testimony of what people tell us, but also the evidence of our own senses, like you said, but then also the evidence of natural reason or logic there, too. Now, on the, uh, uh, the uh, Eucharist there, uh, it's true that uh, we have a conflicting thing because on the basis of testimony alone it looks like an ordinary piece of bread or whatever but on the other hand on the evidence of the uh, authority of the church then we see that there's a great uh, wonderful thing happening at the mass mm -hmm. and so uh, this is what I think uh, we all do as persons is uh, is constantly consider things in the light of those three different forms of evidence. Yeah. Can I make a little bit of a jump here? I'm looking at the time. We're down oh. to about our last five minutes. I want to ask you, and I don't know if this is something that you put a lot of study into, but we, you, you referred to it earlier as about language. Yeah. And it seems like, uh, and this is an area that I don't have much study in at all, but it seems like in the last hundred years or so, a lot of modern philosophers like uh, what, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, yeah, Wittgenstein and, yeah. and uh, guys like that, and uh, maybe Bertrand Russell as well. Yeah, sure, as well. Yeah. Uh, the the whole idea of, of language and philosophy, and, and which very much relates to truth. In fact, you know, the the word right. of God is is truth, and that, that's the the concept of the Father, as Aquinas teaches, right? Uh, the the second person, of right. the, the Blessed Trinity. So, can you comment on that, and, and as it relates to epistemology and language? Uh, well, language is very important because that's the way we communicate concepts and ideas. 
And if we don't have uh, at least uh, uh, the same language and using the same language, we miss each other in the discussion. Uh, <clears throat> but even if we do, we still need to be very clear about how we're using the terms there, like this. Now, um, uh, some of those that you mentioned, like Wittgenstein and Russell, uh, uh, purported to find a, a greater philosophical meaning or importance in the language. But I think instead we should say that language uh, aims at being transparent, that we're not talking about concepts, we're talking about the things the concepts refer to, mm -hmm. you see. It's not just how we use the word justice, but we're talking about the phenomenon of how people re uh, interact with each other there, like this. Yeah, and um, again, kind of scatter shooting a little bit here, but Aquinas, which is the philosopher yeah. that I, I spent the most time studying, has right. this teaching on passive intellect, active intellect, yeah, uh, is that has that stood the test of time? As far as would would you, most philosophers agree that are we have a passive intellect and an active intellect, and we abstract phantasms and uh, uh, you know that kind of thing? Is is that? Is I that would still? say that that hasn't uh, been real successful. Okay. Uh, but uh, then I'd also say, uh, but uh, since you and I are just wanting to know what's true, then. We don't just pick it up because it's convenient. We want to see it for ourselves again, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, whether it's Aristotle or Kant or uh, Plato or any of the rest, uh, St. Thomas says it so well. We don't want to just know the opinions of the philosophers. We want to know what's true. Mm -hmm. And that's what we just decided on. That, uh, in our next session, we're going to talk about what's true and uh, see what you and I can uh, determine on our own, just using our own reason there. Fair yeah. enough? Yeah. Is and you want to argue for the uh, intellect, passive and uh, secondary intellect, uh, this is the Palmer theory? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Aquinas beat me to it, but uh, is, is there a particular philosopher whose epistemology you think comes closest to your own uh, opinion, or who, well, who, who, uh, who do you subscribe to? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, we find uh, with Plato, or with Socrates first, uh, the understanding of, uh, uh, of how the spirit of philosophy is to understand how the world is, to arrive at an understanding of reality and that uh, we uh, try to talk it through in order to uh, determine uh, those things that we can see clearly in the objects that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Plato uh, insisted on this too in, the, in terms of understanding that there are certain realities, again, like beauty and justice, that uh, we, when we talk about them, we understand that there are necessary principles there. And then if we can see those necessary principles, we arrive at an understanding, a level of certainty that uh, uh, takes us out of that realm of probability or possible ex exceptions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we need to talk about next is just two definitions that will help us with that. But maybe we want to stop there. And All right. Well, we will wrap this one up. Uh, this has been a, a conversation with Dr. Ron Moeller. Uh, who, uh, as I mentioned, has a degree in, from philosophy from the University of Dallas and has taught this for many years at uh, the college level and university level. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation about epistemology. We have uh, another one coming, so uh, stay tuned for the next interview with Dr. Muller.